pleased to have uh, to introduce the next uh, panel. And uh, it's about 2D again to serial 3D conversion. So it's a nice segue from where Richard Needham left off. And uh, basically here we want to look more at the details of the business aspects of it. How does it work? How doesn't it work? And, uh, and see how it, it actually fits in terms of technology and again in content development. So uh, the introduction to this is the conversion has become an integral part of the tool set filmmakers use for special effects, for dealing with difficult scenes, or as full production decisions. Converting the extensive international 2D library could be a golden opportunity. What is the business case behind conversion? Could poor quality images stifle the market? What are the monetization possibilities for this new content? And so the help we have today, this uh, great panel we've put together, will be moderated by Don Carmody from Don Carmody Productions. Don, thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Martin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, Discovery and uh, see the extensive lineup that they have on uh, 3D technology that's uh, available in Ontario. It's certain that uh, Ontario is uh, leading the field in uh, a lot of uh, different areas, including 2D to uh, 3D conversion, we hope. Um, that being said, I have, uh, as a producer of feature films that are shot in 3D, I have my own opinions about uh, 2D to 3D conversion, which is basically I don't like it. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I really feel that if you're going to make a 3D movie, you have to, you have to allow for the 3D because it's it's a quite different process, in my uh, opinion, than uh, than a, than making a 2D film. Uh, that being said, I also think that there is opportunity uh, for uh, 2D conversion very much the way that colorization came in and made old black and white movies viable again in the marketplace. So if 3D really takes off, and it's still a little tentative in my mind uh, as a home entertainment uh, uh, blockbuster thing, um, it could uh, be very, very valuable. Um, anyway, to... Uh, to further elaborate on all this, we've got a great uh, uh, lineup of uh, panelists, starting with uh, my immediate uh, left here is uh, Rem Remco Nodeboom um, and uh, from Southpaw Technology, and then uh, Lon Molnar from uh, Intelligent Creatures, who I've done a number of visual effects works with over the years, and as well, uh, next to him is Steve Roberts, CEO of ION, and then uh, finally, uh, uh, Paul Judkins, director and technical of technical film projects and software architect for IMAX. So uh, they're going to give a short presentation each one, and then we'll uh, get into kind of a, a panel discussion. So uh, we'll begin with uh, Paul, and then have Steve, Lon, and Remco present. Okay, thank you. Um, IMAX uh, has been in 3D for quite a while now, so just a little bit of background as it leads to conversion and uh, where we sit with that. Um, first, demonstrate the IMAX 3D format, uh, 1986, so quite a while ago. And since then, we've had a network of 3D theaters. Um, traditionally, films are shot um, with the IMAX cameras, which is a large format film um, camera. It's uh, two large uh, Rolls of film, 70 millimeter, 15 perf is the specific format. Uh, usually one for each eye through a dual lens uh, system, which the lenses are usually your eye distance apart, average eye distance, maybe about an in two and a half inches, and we tend to shoot parallel with those. And the idea behind that is that in our projection system, we tend to mirror the capture situation. So we project the left and right eye, separate prints this time, onto the screen, and we project those at two and a half inches as well. So the idea there is ideally, if you're shooting something that looks 10 feet away, then you sit in the theater in an um, optimal seat, and that will appear 10 feet away. So very realistic, like you shot. We tend not to deal with screen. We deal with theater space, real world space. And we do that because of the large screen, and our geometry is somewhat different. So we create a larger field of view, and 
we've got a 3D viewing pyramid that's um, larger than most. And so we, we feel we can do that without creating miniaturization, more realistic looks. So uh, that, that's, like I said, since uh, late 80s, they've been making films, and that's great. And, but filmmakers find, you know, sometimes the camera system's not available or not suitable for every situation, especially talking 20 years ago. And other times there's historical footage or other existing content that a filmmaker may want to use in their film to tell a story, and they'd rather show that in 3D. So we created a conversion tool in the uh, late 90s. Um, so it's uh, algorithms and a whole production workflow that tracks and uh, runs conversion for films. Uh, we did uh, large format films, and underwater films, space films, leading to about 2006 when we did our first feature Hollywood film uh, here in Toronto. And uh, it was Superman Returns, and Brian Singer was the director of that, and he chose certain action sequences from that he felt would be good in stereo 3D, and we converted those. Turned out really well, so we continued doing that with some films, including the fifth Harry Potter and the sixth um, Harry Potter. If you saw those in IMAX theaters, there were segments of those that were in 3D as well. So, uh, you know, we continue to use that. It's a, it's a great production tool, we feel, for filmmakers. Give them control, flexibility. Um, good examples, I was going to show a clip in a minute, um, from Hubble 3D, which is a IMAX Warner movie we did uh, recently. Uh, most of it shot in space with full 3D cameras, high-res cameras. We have a camera that goes in the cargo bay looking back at the, the Canada arm. and the, So they were working on the... This was about the shuttle mission where they're fixing the Hubble. So it's a very dramatic story. They wanted to tell these events. So there was other scenes. like they, What you'll see is um, you know, a helmet cam, which is like a camera attached to their helmet so you can see them working up close. That was very low-res, very 2D, you know, so 3D conversion on that. There was some, like, basically home movies from space with an HD um, camcorder where they capture astronaut reactions. And so uh, the conversion was done that, and it was, you know, done to be seamless within the movie. So if we can go ahead and run the clip. The first part will be some sections from Harry Potter. No sound. And here, uh, this was a combination of uh, some CG elements, some VFX elements, and a 2D, 3D conversion. Uh, as we went along, we did try and incorporate more VFX elements, but usually in the end we would just get the one DI as a left eye and we would recreate the right. Um, kind of the way we see it go in two different ways is you know, incorporating the th conversion technology into the VFX chain where they've got a lot of elements, they're working on it, they're working with the directors, it can, you know, they can, you know, it's important to get the look n not as an afterthought but really you know, incorporate it into the film and um, it can be a great tool. So we see the conversion going that way. Uh, this is from Hubble, so this will be like a basically HD cam. It's formatted differently for here, of course, than the IMAX theater. Here's the helmet cam. So you can see stuff like this. We see it's, you know, this is kind of post. There's no other information, just one eye. But it's really important. I think it really told a dramatic tale of what they're doing with the Hubble. And, you know, we cut back to, you know, high res, uh, large format 3D, and um, it just gave the filmmaker flexibility. So it's kind of the second way we see it, which is more of, uh, not as a VFX integrated thing, but more as a completely standalone, dedicated pipeline to making uh, 3D from uh, 2D content. And I think it's a little bit different than the VFX model and more focused and dedicated purely to creating 3D. So that's where we sit. Okay. Thank you very much. And next, uh, Steve. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Steve Roberts. I'm the CEO of Ion Software. Uh, we make a product called Fusion, um, which is a visual effects um, compositing system uh, that we first brought, was, goes back to 1988. Um, well, we were showing uh, and doing conversion stuff more like hobby area that in the early 90s um, and at SIGGRAPH in 96 we came out and were showing um, conversion technology at that point. Um, today our product is used on pretty much all the major uh, feature films like Avatar and Iron Man and um, 3D films like uh, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, um, uh, Narnia, The Dawn Trader, um, our Star Wars which is being converted right now using our product, uh, just other examples of what's happening there. Um, I have a, a short, some clips to show you which are all conversion. Um, and some of them are just test shots, but it, we use it to um, basically hone our technology and um, use it mainly as an in-house uh, sort of process to understand uh, what our um, users um, and studios need and everything. So uh, I guess we can run that.
These are from uh, Transformers 3. This is just from the, uh, the trailer. This is from uh, 2012. This is actually a commercial job for um, uh, Australian tourism, um, and again, it's all it's all being converted. So some of the uh, the issues you come up with um, when you convert things are. Things like lots of transparency layers, uh, motion blur, um, uh, fogging, and things like that, that that cause problems, and you you have to solve those when when you're uh, uh, when you're doing the conversion work. So we have to understand exactly what's what's happening in in that uh, in that process, and and build the you know the tools to uh, speed that um, whole process up. So that's what we aim to do at, um, you know, w with our system. That's it. Well, thank you. Next, uh, Lon Molnar, Intelligent Creatures. Thank you. Um, I'm Lon Molnar, CEO of Intelligent Creatures. Um, we've been we we primarily do visual effects, and we got onto the 2D to 3D conversion world through um, almost by accident, just just because of the skill sets are, that are required in. Uh, Visual effects are also required in doing conversion, um, but in in 2005 we were approached by uh, Robert Rodriguez's company Troublemaker to do uh, to work on the last Anaglyph 3D film, which was Shark Boy and Lava Girl, and that was our introduction into 3D. And one of the things that caught my attention were all the high-end visual effects companies uh, out of Hollywood that were involved in this project uh, at the time, including ILM. And uh, you know, it was it was at that point still kind of you know not taken seriously uh, 3D, but I knew there was something going on in, in uh, Hollywood that uh, intrigued us and made us uh, really uh, attracted to uh, get involved in, in the project. So we learned a lot about uh, 3D and convergence and interocular, et cetera, et cetera, and the process from that experience. And then it all kind of went away. And uh, in the last few years, it's, it's kind of come back and it's come back with a bit of a vengeance and uh, primarily the, the conversion work. Uh, we've been approached in the last year to help out on conversion work. Most of it goes overseas because of the price points, and we'll get into that a little later. Um, but uh, we've been uh, approached to, uh, to help out on, on some high-end features that uh, uh, are actually going to be out this, this summer, so I won't be able to show much of it. Um, but the, one of the reasons why we were asked is because of the Canadian uh, the tax credit incentives makes it attractive for them to come to us. Um, also, our process in, in uh, visual effects is, like I mentioned, uh, can be translated to, uh, to the 3D conversion quite easily. And um, it requires basic skill sets and a, a very robust pipeline. And those are things that uh, we have in, in visual effects uh, that we've been honing over the, our skills on over the last many, many years. So uh, it was an easy translation for us. Um, I guess that's about it. I'll, we'll show our reel. All I have to show is our demo reel uh, for IC. Not in 3D, by the way. This is oh. not in 3D. <laughs>
that's right. it. Thank you. And Remco, last but not least. My name is uh, Remco Norubum. Um, I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of a company called Southpaw Technology. We make a product called Tactic. So uh, we come at it a bit different from uh, others here because uh, Tactic is a you know, what's called a production asset management system. And what that means is that we track assets, all the digital files of the content creation process, and we take it right from uh, the initial delivery and through the entire evolution of the processing that goes in within a given organization to delivering those assets out to whoever the client happens to be. Um, so we were uh, originally from the VFX industry and this was uh, usually done in-house and we decided to productize that and have been quite successful in the VFX market uh, and have expanded out to uh, other markets such as advertising and defense as well. So um, we saw this problem of, uh, of being able to manage hundreds of thousands of files as they go through and uh, uh, especially not just from an asset management perspective but also from a human perspective where people have to interact with those files. So tracking things like notes and statuses and uh, where things are at, what versions were the latest, which ones were used, which ones were delivered to whom and when and where. So this is what we've been doing for the last couple of years uh, in all these markets. And uh, uh, we came along, uh, sorry, Avatar came along. And that really changed a lot from us, at least that's from our perspective, where we saw the stereo conversion suddenly just explode. Um, and uh, of particular, uh, we came into a company called uh, Legend 3D in San Diego. And they were a pretty small company at the time. Ironically, they, as you, you mentioned earlier, they were about color correction. That's what they did. And uh, uh, they were able to transfer their color correction process and do some changes. And then um, I guess they got into the market really quickly because they grew from uh, 50 people to 400 people in about eight months. So you can imagine the infrastructure growth that had to go on in that. And so we got in there early with them and have been managing their entire production process from an infrastructure level. Not really from the artistic level, but more from the infrastructure level. Um, also other, and a number of other studios across uh, Hollywood and now starting to see them across, uh, around the world. Uh, anyway, from really big shops to tiny boutique shops who are starting to do really high uh, high-end stereo conversions, people, 10, 12 people sitting in a, in a literally a condominium pumping out uh, um, stereo conversions. So we've seen the market from different countries, different companies doing it different ways, and uh, that's given us a pretty good background on exactly what is happening in the, uh, uh, the 3D industry. So. Don't really have anything to show, except <laughs> database is the sort of underbelly, so. Uh, and databases are scintillating to look essential, at. but. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's move right into our discussion. Um, uh, being a shit disturber from way back, I like to start with a shit disturbing question, I guess, for all of you, is that basically there's, there's two camps right now. You've got the guys that shoot in 3D, like the James Camerons and the Rodriguez and, and whoever are saying, 3D, uh, 2D to 3D conversion is crap, you shouldn't do it, you gotta shoot the movies in 3D. And then you've got the studios, especially those that sort of came late to the process who started you know, deciding that there's a hell of a lot of money here in 3D movies, so how do we make a movie into 3D when we didn't shoot it in? And uh, that it's just as good. So you know, what do you say to both sides of that that argument. Is 2D conversion as good as shooting in, in 3D? And if so, what would you hold up as a really good 2D to 3D feature film? Let's just do feature films because I don't know of any TV that's being done currently. But uh, so let's start with you, Remka. Well, I think it's uh, from a, a, whether you do it conversion or whether you, uh, uh, whether you film it, um, I think there's room for both, uh, partly because uh, what we're seeing in the, in particular the companies, uh, people are shooting it in 3D and deciding they shot it wrong, and the question of having to shoot it again in 3D is way too expensive, so you can fix it in, in post. It's not always ideal, but maybe that's the only choice they have. The second thing is, is that um, 
not a lot of directors necessarily know what they have to do in 3D, and they want to figure that out later. Is that a good artistic decision? I don't know, but it might be a good business decision. And so I think that's why there's really room for both. Okay, and any example of what a good 2D to 3D conversion is so far? Of um, as in terms of ones I've seen? Well, the yeah. yeah. Well, being from the databases, I don't know the artistic point of view. Um, but the panel here is about not whether it's good, but whether there's a business case for it. And I'm arguing that there is a business case. There are lots of companies out in, in Hollywood, and they are getting jobs uh, from not only old companies, uh, old movies, but also um, directors who are deciding that what they did shoot was not right. And so the business case is, yes, there is a business case. There is a market for it. There's lots of people making a lot of money on it. Is it artistically good? I'm, really, I'm not really great to argue on that, but I can say that there's a business case for it. OK. Um, and just to, to sort of clarify, especially with Lon jumping in there, I mean, having shot three 3D feature films, there's always a case for 2D to 3D conversion, a certain portion, usually in visual effects elements, when you really want to bring something off the screen quite slowly, it's almost always some kind of uh, visual effects conversion uh, process is done there. But uh, that being said, Lon, in, um, in your experience, uh, you know, what do you think of the, the values of a, a film shot specifically for 3D versus one that's shot in 2D and then converted? Um, I, I think there's definitely room for both. I mean, I think that uh, conversion is going to be required no matter what. And I think, you know, the example is uh, a James Cameron or even a George Lucas who continues, as long as they have money behind them, they're going to continue to tweak things uh, to their liking forever. Uh, you know, this isn't, we're going to see Star Wars out again next year and it'll be out in, in 3D. And, you know, the next big thing, he'll spend more money and change it yet again. And if there's something that he's not satisfied with in there, he'll spend the money and, and convert it again. I mean, we, uh, for some of the conversion that we've been approached on, there's anything from something very, very simple to just uh, moving pixels, offsetting pixels, to uh, actually rebuilding uh, 3D geometry and doing projections to rebuild a complete right eye. Uh, and if some of the uh, footage we've already done, let's say the visual effect for, it's very easy for us to create the, the right eye. Um, and, uh, and then there's also moments where if they want to spend the money where, as Don mentioned earlier, coming out on the screen, they may have a complete film that was done and they don't have anything coming at screen or they might have the optimal opportunity to be able to have maybe debris shooting past, uh, past screen. So we can create the visual effect for it and we can create a very good uh, stereo effect for that as well. So I think uh, there's definitely a, a business case depending on you know how, who wants to spend and how much, how much they want to spend depending on... Uh, the, the studio and the, how much power the director has. As far as uh, is there a good example, um, th that's a good question. Um, I think there's good examples within films. Clash of the Titans, Alice in Wonderland. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, Clash of the Titans didn't get a very good reputation. I think it kind of threw everything for a spin. Uh, Alice in Wonderland, I mean, you know, it's okay, it's good, it's pretty good. Uh, but I think there's moments in films, and films that I know that we've worked on, that were shot in 3D, publicized to have been shot in 3D, yet there are shots that are done completely as conversion. And uh, so there's sequences and shots within those films that are com completely done in conversion, and the audience probably will have no idea, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, no, I certainly agree with that. All right. Uh, so, Paul? I, I, I guess I see it in a... Again, like two separate streams. If we're talking, you know, um, major Hollywood feature films, mm -hmm. um, I think really the idea of conversion, it's a transitional stage, and it really will just be a, a VFX element, I mean, a, a production tool, because, I mean, most of these films, are, most of them, the sh so many of the shots are assembled anyway from different elements. The idea of shooting 3D is great, you know, and for some of the stuff, but you're adding so many elements after in CG, in um, compositing, that I think it almost makes sense in some ways to apply um, conversion tools to that because you may get a better result, as um, some of the panelists have said. You get uh, more control over the 3D afterwards. There's, um, with our conversion, we, once we do the initial work, and it is a lot of work, manual work up front, um, you then do get complete control over the 3D you want. You can scale it out. You can push things back. You can take elements and move those. You can create more depth. So 
you know, with the VFX elements as they are, there's so many um, depth maps, mats, uh, CG elements existing already. I think it, 3D conversion is a good way to go if, in a VFX chain um, because I think it's, it actually will produce a better result in, in, in the end. Having said that, I mean, it's, you, you, you know, you can't be really well shot 3D. I mean, everything, the detail is, you're never going to match that in a conversion. Although I think perceptually you can create, and I think we have, and um, where you won't know the difference between perceptually you will be able to cut with uh, real 3D, and uh, I think a lot of people won't notice. I think the other side of it, though, of just taking library footage and converting it full scale, you know, we got 26 hours of TV series want to um, convert to 3D. I think it's a diff that's a different mm -hmm. um, issue, and I think. I don't think anyone's there yet. I don't think um, on price point or quality or speed. And I think it takes a little bit of different approach than a VFX. I think it's going to take a little bit of a technology uh, breakthrough. And I think things like Remco, I think I totally agree that um, you know, the, the hardest thing about 3D conversion is kind of the data management, the you know, giving the people, because your project becomes about data management instead of about creating 3D. And I think that's happened a lot in the early conversions. People are just, just you know, they're used to a lot of data in VFX, but they're usually generating that data. and you know. Now to get all the stuff in really quick from you know with changing you know the, the they're not going to lock the film until a couple of weeks before you know it's it's finished that you have your your finish date so you really have to stay on top of that and I think early on a lot of those early conversions just got caught in that and I think uh, people are getting more familiar with that so right. that might shake out too okay and Steve um, well yeah it's a, it's an interesting question um, on on the case of Avatar. About 75% of that film is CG created, and there's only 25% live action um, in, in those scenes. There was uh, about 40 odd shots that were needed to be converted for that particular film. So it's not really a purely um, um, 3D shot film. Um, I see, I see um, the problem with, with heavy visual effects films is that um, shooting 3D, once you move beyond one element, you need to um, have cameras aligned, you know, the second element you can't size and you can't do the tricks that you need to do. Um, uh, you can't have something closer to the camera to make it look bigger, for example. And, and these are things you can do in 2D, but, but they need to be converted afterwards. Um, an example of a good film converted, I thought, was uh, Narnia, Voyage of the Dawn Trader. Um, mm -hmm. That was a pretty good film. It, it had the idea th that they were going to convert it. Uh, so uh, directorially, all the way through that, they kind of knew that. Uh, Clash of the Titans, some of it worked, a lot of it didn't, because it was, um, it was an afterthought. So the cameras moved too much during that particular film to make some of those scenes uh, work. Um, but from our point of view as a, as a toolmaker, uh, we have to solve both ends of the equation. We have to solve uh, shooting real stereo and the problems you get with real stereo with um, polarisation effects from, from uh, reflected mirrors that you use on, on, the, on the rigs to, um, uh, you know, cameras shaking differently because they've been on, they're on a helicopter rig or moving. Um, disparity differences that happen with that and then you have to do the other side of things which is um, you know make make conversion look realistic enough that that it can actually seamlessly integrate with um, uh, with a real stereo film yeah well uh, you bring up a good point I mean going forward um, and uh, certainly in my opinion one of the reasons that clash didn't work is exactly what you're saying it was definitely an afterthought but uh, if a picture is planned to be in 3D, but you're shooting it in 2D, um, does that make the conversion process a lot easier, somewhat easier, or? I, it's, uh, it makes the uh, final artistic result, I think, work a lot better. Uh, visual effects films, because they generally have so much CG environment anyway, and only a few of the elements that are on green screen need to have a depth map associated with them, you can then recreate a full 3D environment anyway. Um, Alice in Wonderland's an example of that, and, and why that one tends to work very well is there's so much created, right? You might only have, you might have 2D live action, but once that's all manipulated and then placed properly in 3D space in the CG environment, you've got real 3D in, in that. Right. I think it does, what you're saying, it's a good point. I think if you plan, it's an address idea, plan to do a 3D movie, shoot it in 2D, 
I think you can really make a huge difference because in the conversion, you're basically dealing with some um, you know, basic things that you need. Segmentation, you're going to have a, holes that you create you need to fill. So you, know, you need um, some basic depth. So if you can plan ahead of it, like shooting almost like old style shooting uh, you know, clean plates of behind objects, then you're going to help a lot with the occlusion. Um, if you doing things, you know, if you keep it in mind that you're going to need segmentation, you're green screening the proper elements that have depth discontinuities so that they're the ones that you ha already have um, separation from, it's really going to save you a lot of the manual work. Mm -hmm. But um, having said that, uh, it also, again, gives you a load of data that isn't quite usable. It's not going to have final grade. It's not going to have the final edit. So you really have to keep that in mind that we, we integrated more and more VFX elements as the films went on. We worked with the same production groups through the Harry Potter, and they um, were very helpful in it. But uh, it really, you know, say, a 20-fold increase in the amount of uh, information we're getting back. And now, with the, let me just ask the question about the Harry Potters, because I was always kind of curious about it myself, is that uh, the last two Harry Potters, they, it was like just a reel was in 3D, or the last 10 minutes was in 3D, or something like that. But when they shot it, did they have it in mind that they were going to have that portion in, in 3D, or was that an afterthought as well? I think definitely on the fifth movie, it was an afterthought. And, but there was a lot of thought put into which scenes to pick. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with what you're saying, that if you choose something you know, for 2D without 3D in mind, you know, it's, not, it's not ideal. And, and faster cuts and certain, types, and certain types of scenes, quite honestly, are almost impossible to do a good conversion of. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they weren't. The second one, it was kind of the same, although they knew they were going to do certain segments um, in 3D. So going in, they had very definite ideas of what, what they thought would work well. And, um, I think by then also after seeing the first one, they had an idea what, what they thought they would like to do it. But the reason we only did a segment was really because you know, quality was the, the main thing we were aiming for, not amount or, you know, so, and we also wanted to do the IMAX type 3D, which again is like world space. We wanted to be somewhat realistic, not a kind of dealing with a screen and playing it behind or you know, just putting things where they are. So, you know, honestly, that was, all we could really do in the amount of time that was available at that quality, at that time anyway. But I've said that everything is about you know, scalability and the resources. So if it's scalable and you have resources, I, I suppose anything is possible from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I know certainly in uh, the technology in filming 3D, uh, just from Resident Evil 4 to Silent Hill 2, which was literally less than a year, uh, the technology has taken leaps and bounds in what we're able to do live in 3D just the size of the cameras have gotten smaller, smaller, the rigs have gotten smaller, the mirrors better, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that type of technology. What are you seeing in the VFX and the computer world for 2D conversion? Is that getting progressively better as well? Um, I, I think the, the, the tools are definitely getting better uh, that they're building, I mean, uh, which is a necessity because I think everybody understands uh, that we need to be more efficient, we need to have, we need to be faster, uh, shots aren't getting turned over uh, like they used to. They're waiting till the edit is pretty tight. They don't want to spend the money. Um, so we, we're having a shorter window, so we need to get faster at uh, turning those shots around. Um, so that's, I mean, that's basically uh, in, in our world. And I think that, again, comes down to uh, people like Remco having a, a very good, robust uh, technology for, for data management. I mean, we need to be much more organized for, uh, for handling all that, that excess data, uh, especially, you know, getting into the world of uh, 4K next and, and, and having two eyes for that. I mean, data is mm -hmm. insane. Um, Remco, I've seen a couple of examples from a Chinese group, uh, a, a Korean group, and uh, even an Ontario group about real-time conversion, 2D to 3D, which I thought was, I mean, it, you're going along watching it, it's really good, and all the, it doesn't work, you know? So what do you think? Do you think eventually that will ever get there? Uh, that's hard to say. It's hard to say what the future can hold for that. I mean, uh, that you know, I'm I'm always wary of auto anything, right? Uh, especially when at least all the people that we've dealt with uh, staunchly uh, say that there is an artistic element to the stereoscopic conversion. And if there is an artistic element, if there's any at point where somebody has to make a decision based on a visual aspect of it um, that is artistic, then it's hard for a computer to replace that quality. And so, and 
it is tricky because the biggest limitation right now, as, as Lon just said, is the efficiency uh, of the process because you're not converting five or ten scenes. Uh, back in the old days when we were doing VFX, that's, you're just doing a, f a few scenes. Uh, they're converting entire movies. So they just get a bunch of movies. The, one of the projects that we worked on, we had to do all three Shrek films in six months. So you can imagine the amount of footage you have to go through. And the limitations of how good the quality really had, at, at that point in time, was not how good the tools were, which d did have a factor, but was the fact that they were delivering things wrong, uh, versions were wrong, uh, throughput was wrong, people had to be trained, and, and nobody really knew what the process actually was. Of how, So they were constantly rearranging the various processes and who delivers to who and which both. And so uh, I think the artistic element really wasn't the limitation. It's just, let's see how we can do it. And is it even possible? And so it's, it's really hard to say whether uh, once the efficiencies start becoming the not the non-limitation of the, or not the limitation of the project, then the artistic elements will start coming in to play um, in, into the quality of the project. Okay, so going back down the line now, uh, and then I, I think we'll open it up for questions, but um, uh, looking a little bit into the future, but taking you know what you personally want to see in, in, in 2D conversion, where would you like it to see it, to see it going from here and how do we make uh, Ontario a center of excellence in, in doing so? Uh, well, there are a large number of companies in Hollywood doing this now uh, and across the world. Um, I'm not quite sure, well, for instance, uh, I don't think there's many companies in Canada. It's probably we're a smaller market. Um, and they're rapidly figuring out how to do this efficiently. and. Uh, uh, I hope someday that this process isn't about efficiency, but at the moment, that's what it is. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to become proficient in at least that aspect of it. Um, I think there's still a big market. There's a huge number of uh, projects out there because the projects I'm seeing are coming in that are larger and larger. We want to take all, what, six films of Star Wars and convert them. We want to take all 36 episodes of this thing and maybe that's what, where it's going to go. So I don't see that ending soon. Whether that's artistically what we want to see, whether the technology is going to last over the next 10 years, 20 years, we don't know. But one thing is, it's here now. Great, thanks. Lon? Um, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, events like this and, and, and uh, getting individuals like us on the panel together more often to, to try and figure out this puzzle, I think it's a bit of a puzzle because it's so new, it's so young, it's still slightly fractured uh, where, where it's going and what it's going to look like. There's still questions as to are they going to open up the libraries? Can they afford to open up the libraries and, and have the conversion done on those? Um, if that happens, then everybody will be forced into jumping in quite quickly, and I think there'll be a huge opportunity. It's it's whether or not we're ready in, in Ontario for it. I mean, I think it, I, I personally feel it's going to explode. It's just being prepared for that. All right. Paul? I think on the Ontario side, uh, five years ago when we decided to do um, this the Superman Returns conversion, it was... You know, there's a lot of thought about that. Where do we do this? How are we going to find the people? Um, and really, it, Ontario was the choice. We set up down, uh, downtown Toronto, just actually around the corner from here. And we needed probably about 150, 200 people in the door. Now, we did set up a process that we, we, we you know, if you put an ad in the paper for people with stereo 3D experience five years ago, that no one's going to come in. So we did have a process for the front end was very industry standard tasks. But we did. We got... Uh, you know, I wouldn't have thought it would happen, but we kind of took a leap of faith on that, and uh, our HR crew managed to get in, you know, a couple hundred people um, at our peak, and we, we got great results, and we really did good. So I think, you know, um, Ontario is one of those few places probably that it is possible. I was involved recently in some, not with uh, IMAX, but in consulting on something that was using more outsourcing type, and, you know, um, only very casual acquaintance with that, but it was not getting the results that we had. We had people in the door, they were in the room, they were trained, um, you know, you could see the, see the results there, and I, I think that was a real advantage. And I think, looking back, we've done that maybe four or five times over the last five, six years of getting people in, and there's, there are people out there 
um, in Toronto and Ontario that have these kind of skills. So I think it, you know, it, it needs a technology breakthrough to do the kind of thing that you're talking about, you know, with I think t as well. And we're in automation. We're really into, you know, technology as well as the people, you know, the way of freeing up people to, you know, leave, let them do their artistic side. But, uh, you know, I think that combined with the, the skill base that does exist, it's, you know, it, if it's going to happen somewhere, I think it, it could happen here as well. Okay, right. And Steve? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think we're certainly part of that, um, that whole technology thing. I mean, we've been working at this for a, a long time and, and with the lion's share of uh, films being done in our software for conversion, I think, I think we're well on the path of, um, you know, just striving to keep making that better and more and more efficient. Um, it's interesting that uh, a lot of the big summer blockbusters coming up are actually converted and not shot. Um, and again, I think this is driven from the visual effects point of view. Um, but one of the things I just kind of tangent on is um, now that we've got 3D capable theatres and everything, one of the things that you got to see in the future is somebody's got to do something very, very different with the new medium. And currently it's being driven by the very left eye, right eye, this has to look stereo, but somebody's got to take that and do something creatively different and it'll happen because of conversion and things like that. And, it, and it'll be artistically very, very different um, because you've got a different dimension you can now play with on the screen. And, you know, and I, I think that's one of the things that'll happen and it'll change people's mind about what the medium really means to filmmaking. Okay, great. And before we take questions, just one final quick question to everybody is, uh, it seems like every uh, decade has seen a, a 3D resurgence and it's always petered out. You know, uh, I got caught in the 80 one. <laughs> and by the time my movie was out, it was all over kind of thing. But uh, I have this feeling that it's, it's, it's certainly lasting a lot longer now than it was before. Is 3D here to stay? And is it going to stick around uh, in your opinion? Uh, well, certainly there's some much better high-end 3D theatres and there's something like 3,500 screens in North America now that are 3D capable and, and actually have um, uh, good viewing capabilities. That's a big, big plus. Uh, 3D televisions um, are becoming prevalent. Every, every TV manufactured from this point on is 3D capable. Um, and the, one of the big drivers is the games level of the industry. Games trains the young children to see 3D and they will become the 3D consumers of the future. All right. Yeah, I also feel that 3D is here to stay this time. I think because much of the resurgence is, it's a byproduct of technology in that you know, you've got the fast refresh on the TVs, you can do the 3D, it's kind of, you get it for free now. And with you know, digital projection, I think that's a big thing. Um, Big thing for us because uh, our print costs, you know, were doubled. They're, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So now you go to 3D, and same with the, you know, 35. It's just simpler now. You have digital projection. Although I, you know, I see the big resurgence too is because of the premium ticket price. And I think this, what you're saying every film has to be 3D now. And you know, it's just my personal opinion. But I think that may drop off as it becomes the norm. And you know, it's it's an option, but not necessarily has to be 3D. But I, I think it's uh, definitely here to stay. Um, I agree. I think it's here to stay. Uh, I think there's a lot of money invested into uh, infrastructure and new technology and you know uh, consumer uh, televisions. That uh, as long as that, if that starts picking up, uh, it, it's going to do really well. Uh, I think that's the only question right now: is it, is it going to pick up in the home? But uh, other than that, you know, they're they're making money in in the theaters off 3D. Uh, a lot of a lot of money off of it. So I think it's 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 here. Right. Yeah, I think the big thing is is that it's in the home, and previously it wasn't. Uh, this, it's going to be driven not necessarily by films, which will be part of it, but it'll also be the the games, as you said, and the uh, and also 3D sports. And watching those is a real different experience than. Uh, so it's not going to be necessarily just conversion. It's 3D, and uh, that's why I think it's going to stay. Um, we would like to get rid of the glasses, but. Well, it's, it's hard to tell whether that's going to be a necessary component or not in the future. All right, good. Well, I hope there's some conversion. I want to see all the James Bonds in 3D. Okay, so opening up for questions. I have a question. Uh, James Stewart, I'm a producer-director with Geneva Film Company. Um, 
given that everyone seems to have a very difficult time naming any 3D feature film that was converted that actually looked good um, of the 20 some films that have been released, do you, do you really think going forward, um, would you take legacy films out of, the, out of the mix, but going forward, there really is a business model for conversion. Um, as an effects tool, yes. Um, and as, as we see the tools for shooting live action come down and the knowledge base going up and people understand how to shoot 3D, is there really a future for taking a, a film, shooting it 2D, converting it? Is there really a case for that? So a couple of questions. So Don, you just finished shooting your second digital 3D film in, two, in one year. Um, are you, you know the cost, you know, you understand it. Are you, would you ever convert, uh, shoot in 2D and convert a film? Well, I, I think I did mention we do, do, con do conversions on certain visual effect shots and on Resident uh, Evil 4, there was actually one sequence that the cameras were so damn big, we couldn't get what the director wanted, which was basically to put the camera on a spin around type thing. So we, we shot that sequence in 2D and it was a fight with Chairman Wesker and that was, fully converted that one sequence. Um, on Silent Hill 2, we wouldn't have had to do that because the cameras are now that small. We, we actually got Steadicam on Silent Hill 2. Um, that all being said, uh, I think if, if a picture is, is planned properly for 3D and the director knows what he's doing, and in my personal opinion, the only 2D conversion I've seen that I liked was, was uh, Alice in Wonderland, Tim Burton's. Um, uh, you know, because the director really has to understand that it is a very different way of making films. You cannot do those fast MTV style cuts anymore. You can't do big action sequences, cannot be, you know, quick cuts and, and, and quick, you know, uh, wipes and, and, and pans and things like that because they just don't work. So, um, you know, if a director comes in and he knows what to do, if he's studied 3D, then I think a 2D conversion is possible. Will it ever be as good as filming in 3D? I don't know, the technologies are chasing each other. Certainly the, the shooting in 3D technology is, is moving in leaps and bounds, uh, and I imagine that the technology of conversion is, is moving pretty damn fast as well. Yeah, so give, moving forward, given that um, I have a laptop that does real-time 2D to 3D conversion, the TVs now are coming out, it's not, it's not great, but um, but it, you know, consumers have uh, lower standards on TV than they do in the cinema screen. Um, where do you see the conversion world going? Like, where is it in 10 years? Uh, well, certainly for real time, the conversion, um, it's certainly not Hollywood ready. Uh, you've got a lot of critical eyes looking at that. And if it's not real 3D, um, then you don't, it, it, it's not ready for prime time for that, those guys. Um, there's certainly, you work on tooling to help your process, right, to understand it. It doesn't have to be real time. You can have a very compute intensive uh, analysation of a scene, um, you know, to, to make the process happen. Because you only convert it once. You can view it as many times as you like, you know, in, in 3D once, once something's done. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, it's one of those necessary things. Like I was saying, that the major, the, Thor, for example, is a film that's out at the moment that's converted. Captain America is another one coming out. The, um, a lot of these uh, Transformers 3 is about 50% shot, 50% converted because, again, the, the action sequences that they needed to do, they can't get the rigs uh, and the cameras uh, in, into that. Um, so uh, everything, has its, everything has its place, you know. Um, if, if you look back five years ago or ten years ago, it's like, oh, no, we'll never shoot green screen. We'll definitely always build sets. And now, you know, Robert Rodriguez does Sin, Sin City, for example, and, and everything's a virtual set. And then it becomes a norm that, that all environments become CG because they look so good, right? And, and so it just becomes a tool that, that you have at that point. Yeah. I would just note that probably the best uh, theatrical conversion I've ever seen is the work that Paul's team did on those uh, Harry Potter films. It looked, looked like 3D and uh, it was on an IMAX screen so th there was nowhere to hide really. Great, thanks. Hi, Jonathan Barker. I've made quite a few 3D films over the last 17 years but um, I really have a comment 
that anyone can comment on uh, is the in, you know picking up on what Remco said about now that 3D is in the home, that's where this is really going to uh, prove itself in terms of the long run. And uh, wouldn't you say that it's the case that if the TV, the TV manufacturers, from my perspective, what's happened is the TV manufacturers jumped on, said, now we sold everybody these flat screen TVs, now we got, we got to find something else to sell them, now we're going to sell them 3D TVs. And uh, you, either one of two things has to happen. The broadcast, uh, the, the cost of 3D production has to dramatically decrease, or, um, or there's going to be massive auto conversion. Because the broadcasters, you start a 3D broadcasting in 3D, you know you have to fill 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How the hell are you going to do that? All of the producers in the world aren't going to give them with budget with the kinds of budgets it takes are not going to give them the product it seems to me that auto conversion if 3d is going to survive other than as a specialty item as it's been in the past and the films i've made have all been for specialty markets basically but it seems to me inevitable that it's going to last only because the tools for auto conversion are made to work i don't know if anybody has a comment on that well this is the same argument i heard about 10 years ago about having full 3D episodic television and saying that it wasn't possible because there was we couldn't do it cheap enough, we couldn't do it fast yeah. enough, and now you see it everywhere. And why? Because the tools, the efficiency, and all yeah. that has put it into a price point where it was actually profitable. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Jonathan, because uh, about I, I think we've been lucky so far that the, the 3D channels that have launched, and. Um, IMAX has launched a channel with Discovery and Sony, and I know in Europe there's Sky. They are showing, I think Sky has a you know, policy, which I don't, don't agree completely, but that uh, there's no conversion shown on it. And I think what they mean by that is they're not going to try to rush to the bottom to get just stuff up there with auto conversion. So, but, uh, uh, you know, um, we're lucky in the dis Discovery. They have a lot of content. They're, they're, they're trying to, to get their new shows, pushing them to... to um, to shoot in 3D, and I think you know, those tend to be more, you know, um, documentary or uh, you know, reality type things. So it's a different sort of thing, and you know, almost the kind of prosumer cameras that are coming out are, are going to do that. So I think it 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 is working that way. And I, but I do think the auto conversion does have to uh, say no auto, but you know, it does need a new new system, a new dedicated just for for 3D conversion um, does need to come out. And I think you know, right now it's possible. I think just the um, with people, manual, and some automatic. We use a lot of automatic um, depth generation in our process as well to try and make things you know, better, more detailed, and faster. But it, it's just not there as, as it is. And I think it's the price coming down for TV. Exactly. That's, you know, if we're talking about 100,000 bucks a minute for yeah. a film, you know, and that's, you know, I don't know what TV was, but you know, I've heard numbers like $1,000 a minute or something. And you know, I think we're a long way away from that. So I, I think hopefully that the content and, you know, um, people shooting the 3D and you know showing your films, which are shot with you know stereo and that that with like sports, and it's enough to fill the gap until you know uh, it does catch up with with the um, I think cheaper stereo you know production and hopefully then an auto conversion that's uh, at a point where people can use it. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, and just to add to that, I mean I I think that you don't have to have one or the other uh, automa automation or having an artist or doing projections or creating depth maps uh, manually, um, you can actually automate you know, the whole show and then bring in a director and producers and pick out select shots throughout it that are key moments and, and add on top of that. So depending on what your budget is, what the content is, if, if there's more money you can throw at it because you're going to make that back in ad revenue, um, there'll be different variations. It's just like visual effects. You don't have one standard of visual effects. It's quite a range of visual effects. And I think uh, conversion is going to be the same thing. Okay, next question. Um, hi, my name is Amir. I'm a, a PhD student of uh, 3D computer vision at the University of Windsor. Um, we all remember those 3D magazines with, with um, 3D images. So we have to uh, uh, wear those 3D glasses. I'm referring to an anaglyph technology, right? Yeah. At a time, it was like 10 or 15 years ago, at my time actually, I was uh, predicting to see um, 3D textbooks actually 
book with 3D images so that uh, those images could deliver uh, more educational experience to the kids at school. But it didn't happen. I, you know, it was a new trend at the time, so I was, um, I w I was loving watching, uh, actually checking out those 3D images and uh, looking around to all the bookstores um, and searching for all 3D images and everything. It was a, a very nice <coughs> experience for me. And uh, like I said, I was uh, expecting to see everywhere ter everything turning from 2D to 3D. All the textbooks at school, all the textbooks at the universities to deliver more educational experience. But it didn't happen. So it just disappeared within two, three years or five years or something. Don't, don't you think that the same thing that happened to the uh, 3D printed, uh, printed materials can happen to the 3D movies? Like after a few years, it's not going to be no, uh, it's no longer be a trend or people would will get tired of it, they want to get back to the 2D because, they, because of their eye strain or problems like that. So uh, how can you compare that experience with the experience that we are uh, actually seeing that? Well, I mean, the experience has gotten so much better even from the 1980s, let alone from the old red and uh, blue or red and green uh, 3D. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons that it's, it's actually stuck around this long is that the experience is actually quite comfortable for people. And now that you're seeing the games, especially, almost all coming out uh, yeah. 3D, and uh, the younger generation really becoming very used to watching stuff in 3D, that's personally where I think you know, the, the future is going to lie uh, in keeping 3D uh, from being just another flash in the pan. Maybe not such a flash this time, but, uh, but whatever. It's just that, and I think as the digital quality continues to improve and refresh rates get faster and faster and televisions get better and all of those things that the, the audience will become uh, comfortable with 3D. And you talk about books, the iPad's gonna go 3D, I'm sure. Mm. So you can have 3D experience on what's going to now be, because books are you know, pretty much going to go to the way of the uh, dodo eventually. Do you, do you think we will see more, uh, more actually 3D books again? Uh, so the 3D books will be printed again, or because not, now it's a new trend, but this time for 3D TVs. We'll see the 3D books as well? Well, the DS is already 3D right now, Nintendo DS, and you don't need glasses for that. Mm. So um, yeah. it's very possible as the technology increases. See, so that's a, a, you, the, big uh, the big crutch right now is the, the glasses, and that, that's stopping widespread adoption everywhere. Mm. And we all rea realize that, and so it's a good question of whether it will. This will be uh, the the problem that will make it fade, or will we be able to overcome it, or whether it's something we don't mind wearing, or um, uh, whether we'll be able to find the technology that doesn't require glasses. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. On the games, uh, the size they can use the lenticular screen, which you don't need. On a big screen, that doesn't quite work. Although I did see one in Russia, which is great. But it went like that, and it <laughs> fell apart. But <laughs> all right, any more? Yeah, there we go. So, what is a good 2D to 3D converter? The one that synthesizes a missing view, uh, which makes it look like the actual view captured by the second camera, or the the algorithm or system or whatever that incorporates your artistic skills to produce some effect that makes the, the viewer enjoy the, the, the result. Well, for I think it's, for example, I, sorry. I think what you're saying is kind of, um, you know, we've tended towards realism just because it suited our format and it, you know, it's a lot easier. It just make it how it looks. And instead of what the films we were doing, I think, like Steve was saying before, uh, uh, really, if you think about it with 3D conversion, it does open a hole if you wanted to. You could do whatever crazy depths you wanted. It doesn't have to be real. So I think it's, you know, it comes down to an artistic decision and um, you know, just finding the right person who has the right approach to that. And so if I'm developing algorithms, and let's say I have my stereoscopic content, and I just set the right channel aside, and I develop my 2D to 3D converter, then I get a synthetic or synthesized right view. Now I can get an objective measure compared against the right view to see how well I'm doing. So if I get a very small error, can I say that I'm doing a good job or? or yeah, I think it's one thing we probably haven't talked about where conversion goes and I think it is, well, we, you, um, 
it has been touched on actually, is it's shot in 3D. The 3D exists, but you want to change it. And that can be for, it's not quite what we wanted, or you know, to, to, to show the clips here, I had to reformat the 3D. Um, I did a very simple version, but uh, it, you know, the same 3D we show in IMAX that is not going to work on the screen. So I, I needed to change it. So you have a stereo view, you, you, uh, you can still apply conversion. And if you have great stereo matching, you're, a lot of your hard work's done. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. my experience with directors is if they can change it, they will. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I work for a company that produces one of those chips that you're talking about for TVs. And I can tell you that the algorithms are oversimplified and just tuned to produce some effect. Let's say if I show that to my sister, she will say, oh, yes, it looks, yes. Oh, the auto, the auto 3D. Yes, yeah. on the TV. And, and I think if we compare that against the kind of conversions that you guys are doing, for example, especially the IMAX one that I saw, mm -hmm. it's, it's day and night. Well, it yeah, also so comes down to what the filmmaker wants. And I think the one thing that Jim's, James Cameron did uh, in Avatar that uh, was instrumental in where 3D and feature films is going now is that he said, wait a minute, it's not all about crap coming out of the screen at you. It's about bringing the audience into the screen. And uh, which was something that uh, when, before we did Resident Evil, we looked at all the, we looked at virtually every 3D film ever made, all the way back to House of Wax and Dial M for Murder and you know, all of that type of stuff. And the most successful and the most comfortable experiences were the ones that weren't poking you in the eye every three minutes. And I did a picture in 1983, which was like, yeah, we poked them every 10 minutes, give them a reason to wear the glasses, it was, was our philosophy. But in Resident Evil, we followed what Cameron was doing, and we followed that with Silent Hill, is bring them into that world. You know, you don't have to poke them all the time, it's to get the, use the depth to bring the audience into you. So, and that requires a filmmaker and, um, and technology and, and, and engineers and everything to achieve that. And we love it if a filmmaker wants that because that makes conversion a lot easier. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm happy with that. Thank you.